The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is supported in part by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, conserving the wild things and wild places of Texas thanks to members across the state. Additional funding is provided by Toyota. Your local Toyota dealers are proud to support outdoor recreation and conservation in Texas. Toyota, let's go places. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. This is the first time to rehabilitate bears and release back into the wild. We use a lot of trail cameras here and it kind of just helps us monitor the types of species we have. Now to go hunting, wake up at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, I just barely have to tap him and he's out of bed. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. The habitat here is undisturbed. Some of the best habitat in the area. To get to adequate bear country, which we've selected here, Devil's River State Natural Area, you have to get off the beaten path. We're hoping that this is the first step in reestablishing this population of bears in West Texas. It's a great opportunity to put some bears back on the landscape. This is a happy story about bears, but it did not start that way. A black bear and her cub were spotted roaming around a Del Rio neighborhood, causing quite a scene with neighbors. It was a somewhat chaotic situation that had a tragic ending. Officials said the mother bear was shot and killed by a resident. The cub is now in custody of state officials. Two separate black bears in sad circumstances. One was orphaned from a Del Rio resident that shot the mother. The other bear was in a, a horrific train accident. The party that she was a part of, two were killed by the train. And this is the last one of the group. Four to five year old female. They weren't in good shape. And given the age of the cub, it was m my feeling that we weren't gonna be able to do anything for these bears. This bear has gone from 60 pounds. She weighed in at 128. Enter Dr. Kathleen Ramsey. So she's really put on a lot of weight. She is a veterinarian in New Mexico. Animals need help, and that's why I'm a veterinarian. They can't just knock on your door and say, here I am. All wildlife, I don't care what it is, needs help. So, yes! yes. At her wildlife clinic, Dr. Ramsey has successfully rehabilitated more than 600 black bears been doing rehabilitation for over 40 years now. It's been an interesting challenge. The first two Texas bears that I know of being rehabilitated. I live in northern New Mexico. We do northern New Mexico bears and not Mexico bears, so I had to first figure out what does she eat. They're getting their second chance is what it's all about. One, two, three. Okay. Our success in rehabilitation is by getting these animals on the natural diets that they would be eating in the wild. So she's been eating acorns, she's been eating pecans, roadkill, juniper berries, prickly pear fruit, prickly pear petals, making her eat what she should be eating in Texas. The bears must have liked the menu because they put on some weight. Gives them a better chance of survival. The big bear, she came in about 60 pounds, went out at 128. Yeah, right there, Ty, is probably good. This little cub, she came in at 30 pounds, and Miss Texas went out at a whopping 102 pounds. All right, she's ready to go. She's free. Very healthy. Good water, good food, good place to let her go. Next couple of days are really hard for these bears. They've got to figure out where the other bears in the territory are. 
They've got to figure out where the food bases are. So they've got a lot of exploring and a lot of learning to do, and so they don't have to worry about eating. While the bears pose little threat to people, they can endanger one another. So releases happen miles apart. This bear would just go turn around and go kill that other bear in minutes, um, just by nature. And so I really like to keep my adult bears away from my younger bears to give them a better chance. Yeah. When you release an animal, it came in because something was wrong. It wasn't doing well. She's just been sniffing and sniffing and sniffing. It smelled like home. It's home. It's totally dependent on me making it do perfect so it can survive in the wild. Did I do a good enough job? Did I teach her well enough? And unfortunately, I'm not going to know this for a while until Ryan calls me one day and says she's in a yard or we never, ever hear about this bear again. Then I did my job right. Dr. Ramsey did an outstanding job getting these bears ready for release. And her fee for months of expert bear care? Nothing. It's been an honor for me to be the veterinarian that got to work with them. Bring it to my door and I will make an honest attempt to get that animal back into the wild where it belongs. Just watch her, she's pissy. <sighs> This bear is ready, ready to go. It's a big day for a couple of bears, for the people who care about them. Everybody ready? And for keeping West Texas wild. Look at her. She's just going to fall right out. The joint effort between these two states has been phenomenal, and that's what allowed these two kids to go back into the wild. I am ecstatic. I, I think she's going to do quite well. I'm hoping Big Mama, within a year, will be raising her first baby Big Bear, and we've increased the number here in Texas. My name is Daniel Rios. I am the resource specialist at Ray Roberts Lake State Park. When monitoring wetlands, it's not only important to know what's in the wetland, but also what's around it to really tell you the health of that wetland. So we could put a nice tree camera up high on this one to get some footage of any animals coming up this game trail here. We'll put it up high, so hopefully the raccoons don't steal my cameras this time. We're actually going to go out and start cutting out some mesquites out of our prairies. As the resource specialist, my uh, team and I, uh, we do a lot of uh, natural uh, restoration type projects. So we do prairie restoration and forest management as well as wetland monitoring. We'll go through an area and we try to restore prairies and forest back to what they originally looked like before invasive species were introduced to this area. And if we don't take them out, they'll continue to spread and they'll take over the area completely. Things like deer will kind of avoid this area because they won't be able to get through here. The resource team and I do a lot of conservation, preservation, and restoration. One of the ways we can kind of determine if an area is healthy or if, if it needs some type of restoration is actually the types of animals that are in it. In our wetlands, we have uh, quite a few beavers, and beavers are a keystone species. If we have lots of beavers, then we know that that wetland ecosystem is very healthy because they're the ones that build and maintain that ecosystem. And so without them, those dams will break and, and the water will be released. All the other animals that are living in that ecosystem will die off. We use a lot of trail cameras here and it kind of just helps us monitor the types of species we have because that helps us determine if what we're doing is working. If we restore an area where we're trying to get more turkey and quail into that area, um, we'll put some game cameras out and we get a lot of turkey and quail in that area, we know that we were successful in those efforts. When we're out placing cameras, there are certain things we look for. One of them is uh, tracks. So here's some uh, 
deer tracks, and it seems like it's leading through a uh, very distinctive game trail going across here. We have all our special trails here for the hiking trails and biking trails, but uh, kind of animals make their own little trails. A lot of times we'll just kind of follow those to see where they go. Uh, another thing we look for uh, if it's rutting season is marks on the tree where the, uh, the deer have actually kind of tried rubbing the, the felt off of their antlers. Right here, this tree right here, those are actually the rut marks I was talking about. When we're looking for uh, beavers, one thing we'll look for is dams that they've built, which is a collection of sticks, mud, and rocks. They've kind of built up an area to flood the grounds behind it. So here's a good sign that there are active beavers around here doing what beavers do, which is eating trees with those giant yellow teeth that you see. We use three different types of containers or stands for it. So in a grassland area, if we're trying to monitor that, we'll use actual tall stands so we can see over the grasses, so we can see like the deer moving through. If we're in a forested area, we have attachments for trees. And then for kind of our wetlands and other areas where we want to get some smaller animals, so like your, your beavers and otters, we actually have ammo boxes that we've kind of changed into containers for these game cameras. This ammo box we actually kind of built ourselves. It was just a cheap $5 ammo box that we drilled some holes in. And that is so we could actually put it down lower and attach it to a tree because we have had several cameras get stolen by animals around here. Especially raccoons. We're not only just looking to see what species are there, we're also looking to see if they're healthy. Chronic wasting disease within deer is a kind of a big problem. And so if we can record our deer, because we, we can't just walk up to our deer and check them like a vet does, we'll record them and then we'll see if they have any signs of chronic wasting disease so the, the chronic wasting disease doesn't spread to other deer. One of the uh, most exciting species that we've actually got are beavers and our otters. We've never actually seen beavers here. We've seen signs of them, but we've never actually seen them until we started doing kind of some studies down in our wetlands. With that study, we actually started get, uh, capturing video of otters because otters really weren't known to be within this area. The very first clip we ever got was just this otter that kind of walked up and just looked at the camera and then just turned around and walked away. We enjoy putting out the cameras because we actually get to see all these animals and what they're doing in their natural environment. We're at the Roger R. Fawcett Wildlife Management Area. We're about 65 miles west of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. It's in the southern part of the Cross Timbers where we've got a lot of unique habitats here. We've got open grassland prairie habitat bisected with post oak, blackjack oak woodlands. We've got a lot of water on the area. Provides good habitat for waterfowl. And here on the south end of the area, we've got some dove fields. We've been planting native sunflowers here for doves, provide a good feeding area, also provides good public hunting opportunity. The Fawcett Wildlife Management Area is just one of many public hunting lands that are open for public access in Texas. We now have just over a million acres of land that's accessible uh, with an annual public hunting permit or the limited public use permit. This time of year, we offer walk-in dove hunting with the use of the annual public hunting permit. You self-register it, and you just go find a good spot to hunt. Oh, I like this spot a lot. Where do you think they'll come in from? 
I think they're going to be coming from the creek behind us and coming into the sunflower field and kind of landing. I think we're in a perfect spot. You know, to wake him up to go to school, I have to tell him a couple times. Now to go hunting, wake up at 4.30, 5 o'clock in the morning, I just barely have to tap him and he's out of bed. <laughs> he beats me out the door, you know, so, and that's, it's our time to get away and um, spend some quality time together as father and son, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. The birds ain't coming. <laughs> it's a real nice breeze. It's perfect. I love when we go hunting. It's always a good time, and if we don't get something, we're at least happy to go or get out the house. It's uh, like real good weather for dove, I think. And I hope they like it. <laughs> if they like it, then I'm liking it. He was at a pretty good distance, wasn't he? Yeah, he was farther than usual. That one got away. <laughs> that's, that's the fun part about dove hunting. You know, it's just all of a sudden, you're just blasting away and just trying to get one. So it's fun. To have access to public land like this, I mean, it's a dream. It's perfect right now because we're the only ones out here. So it's ideal. And the scenery behind it with all these hills, I mean, it's, it's just beautiful. You couldn't ask for a better place right now. Did you get one? I did. You, you bumped him up for me. <laughs> Where'd he come from? <laughs> he come from right, behind, right beside you. He flew behind you. Oh, didn't even see it. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a good one. Actually, he helped me out. He kind of, he kind of scared it out, you know, and it come in behind him, and I, I took him down one shot. You know, the birds are active keeps you active, and it's just a fun time, really. It's perfect. It's memories that we will both remember forever. This is a challenge up here. Robert Newman looks after the Franklin Mountains like no other. His passion for this place is cultivated high up in the hills. A tool in hand. I just take it day by day, one rock at a time. And a plan in his head. He is the trailblazer. Yeah, that's looking all right. Robert's about to turn 79. A cup of Joe and the El Paso Times are his way to kickstart the morning. But I do have a three-star day. The maximum is five stars, so I have a three-star day today. And I don't go out every day. I'm too old to go out and do this every day. You can sense a bit of morning aches and pains for Robert, but the trail calls. I don't mind being out there by myself. I just love sitting there and looking at the scenery out there. This is going to be a pretty rough ride. I'm going to go very slow. Uh, today we are at the Tom Mays unit of the Franklin Mountain State Park. We're going up to where I'm working on the new trail. There's existing trails. Well, actually, old bulldoze roads, but whoops, <laughs> that are really tough. So I'm trying to put in one that's going to be more user-friendly. From four-wheel to feet, Robert has another half-mile walk up through the rugged terrain to get to his work site. Keep them on the upside. So this I'm going to leave because I don't want to push them away from the downside. But this I'm going to take out because I want them to get closer to the upside. Robert's a retired math teacher. You know, they used to do all this by hand. They didn't have mechanized stuff. 
He's been building trails up here all by himself for 15 years. Ah, my rest bit. Ah. Oh, I hadn't gotten very far today. But, like I say, uh, I'm in no more hurry. Oh, it'll be here tomorrow, too. Now this is about where we are right now. We're nearing this first rock slide, right in here. To calm his nerves, Robert goes over the plan with Park Superintendent Cesar Mendez. The idea is to get rid of this section over here because it's too steep. First rock slide. He's willing to spend hours and hours of his life, I mean days, months of his life, devoted to doing something right for the mountains and for the people to enjoy. His mathematician mind uh, helps him to have this greater comprehension that the, sometimes the average person doesn't have. He understands the slopes very well. Uh, he understands drainage. This not as bad as I thought it was going to be. I can see a line through here now. Uh, I think it'll be all right. I have to come through here several more times. <sighs> when I'm at home and I can't get out here, I'm frustrated. I need to get out here. I want to get out here. I don't know, I just love being out here. Over the years, Roberts built more than 12 miles of trail, all by these hands. Building these trails, like I say, it's a challenge to see if I can put in a trail that's gonna be hackable and bikeable and sustainable. One that's gonna last more than four, five, six years. You don't know what's here until you get out of your car and get up in the mountain. Just driving by on the freeway over and looking at these, you don't realize how much depth there is, how much variation there is here. And you can get back in some of these canyons and, and feel like you're in a complete other world. It took a good year for Robert to finish the Agave Loop Trail, and it's now open. They're still on the ridge going up. So I guess they're gonna do the whole thing. His reward is seeing people that are using the trails, and that's all. Can I hug you? Oh, thank you very thank much. Thank you very much, I love your trail. <laughs> Out of seven days, maybe we come four or five times oh, a week. Oh, well, great, that's fantastic. <laughs> It does help relieve stress. They yeah. just, when you're out here, you're not thinking about anything, anything else except you better concentrate on the trail. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there they are. They're coming back. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Way to go. Good job. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. Thanks for coming out and riding it. That's what makes it all worthwhile to see y'all come out and ride it. The next morning, there's that familiar sound up on the mountain. Uh, and it doesn't look like Robert's coming down anytime soon. Right now, I still feel good. As long as I make, I'm going to be out here doing this.
This series is supported in part by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, conserving the wild things and wild places of Texas thanks to members across the state. Additional funding is provided by Toyota. Your local Toyota dealers are proud to support outdoor recreation and conservation in Texas. Toyota, let's go places.